All right, welcome back. You're listening to Truth Brigade Radio on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. If you want to join us for the text chat, head over to TruthBrigade.com. I'm really excited about tonight's guest, but I, I, gosh, I was so excited in the intro just that I had internet. I forgot to share the good news. First of all, I would like to thank all of our affiliates uh, transmitting the show throughout the country. Uh, you know who you are. Thank you so very much. And the real good news is we also um, got the transmitter together and we'll start uh, broadcasting in the local airwaves in Austin in just a jiffy, too. So that is wonderful news. Thank you for your support at American Freedom Radio. If uh, you're interested in becoming an affiliate or advertiser, uh, please go to the website, AmericanFreedomRadio.com, and all the information you need to contact the fine gentleman, uh, Danny Romero, and everyone else at the network, and they will get you hooked up with high-quality streams. Our special guest tonight, Dr. Claude Swanson. You can find out uh, more about him and the book at synchronizeduniverse.com. Um, just an amazing background, an amazing book. I am so glad to have you here tonight, Dr. Swanson. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Christy. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, well, my goodness, I know you're busy because you're also working on your next book, Life Force, The Scientific Basis. Um, I, I really want to talk about that. But if you would, uh, can you start off just uh, giving the listeners a little bit about your background and uh, what led you up to the first book? Sure. I'll give you a little bit of a mini bio, if you don't mind. Um, Please. I, I, because I, you know, you, you, in this life, we never know where we're heading. You know, we just kind of follow our nose, and and then one day we look back and we say, "Oh my God, this made made sense." You know, <laughs> and it's hard, it's hard to know sometimes in advance. Uh, I grew up in a small town in southern Virginia, and uh, I was very curious about the universe. Uh, so I went to a college at MIT and got a, a physics uh, bachelor's degree there. I thought I would get all my answers for how the universe worked, and you know, even though you learn a lot in uh, your physics classes, it, it didn't seem satisfying to me. It seemed like okay, they have the experimental results, and they could put together a theory that'll you know produce predict those results, but it didn't seem like it really hung together. It didn't answer deep questions. So I went to grad school at uh, Princeton University in physics, got a Ph.D. there, and then later did a postdoc at Princeton and at Cornell, and, you know, kept thinking, well, I'm going to find out the really deep answers, and it's all going to make sense. And, and, and you know, what, I, what bothered me was some of the really fundamental things in physics, like the charge on the electron, a whole lot of basic properties, we still really cannot predict from first principles. A lot of these we've kind of put in from measurements, which tells me that we don't have the whole picture. And even today, unified field theory, which means trying to include gravity with everything else, you know, it really doesn't work yet. So I, I kept feeling like, man, there's something missing. Mm -hmm. um, about 10 years later, um, I, I, I began coming across some very strange ideas. I began hearing about this from people I knew who I trusted. Uh, the first one was remote viewing. And some of the stories I heard was someone could go down into a, a vault, a shielded room, and go into a light trance. And in their mind, they could go and read documents in a, a safe or a file drawer thousands of miles away. Well, you know, by the physics that I'd been taught, uh, that's ridiculous. That's totally impossible. Uh -huh. and yet I was hearing about it from people who I trusted. So that, that sort of started my search for uh, what am I missing? Or what else goes on in the universe that our current science doesn't include? And um, I've been looking for maybe over 20 years since then. And what I found is there's a lot that's left out of our current science. Um, and so my first book called The Synchronized Universe is New Science of the Paranormal and really tries to, first of all, say, what's the evidence? Pull together best evidence. And then secondly, say, well, how can our science be modified or expanded to start to explain these things? So that's kind of what I've been doing. 
Okay. Well, you know, you talked about um, uh, Princeton, and your uh, PhD thesis was done in the gravity group. Can you tell us a little bit about the gravity group? Sure. And you have to realize, in those days, I had no clue about all the weird forces. Um, at that time, that was before the Princeton Pear Lab with Robert John and Brenda Dunn had started. So there was no ESP work that I'd ever heard about. And okay. probably in the in, in the state of in, in my state of mind in those days, I probably wouldn't have believed it anyway. You know. Um, but the Princeton Gravity Group uh, was headed by uh, uh, David Wilkinson and Bob Dickey. Bob Dickey's a Nobel Prize. Well, no, I'm sorry. I take that back. He's not a Nobel Prize winner. But uh, but he invented the Maser and very respected physicist. Um, yeah. And what they were what they were trying to do is invent new tools to look into the cosmos, uh, n n new types of sensors and devices that can allow us to look deeper into space and measure uh, phenomena that our present uh, devices can't see. And uh, so my, my thesis there in the gravity group was on the Josephson Junction, which was a device to, to try to look at uh, the far infrared radiation, which is um, waves that are longer than light waves, and they're shorter than microwaves in the middle. And the, the nice thing about those waves is they will travel uh, through dust. And the center of our galaxy has a lot of dust in it, and you can't see the center very well. But the hope was if we could see really well with uh, millimeter waves or, or sub-millimeter, we'd be able to see the center of the galaxy where there's a dark a black hole. So that was kind of what we were doing back then. Wow, interesting. Well, you know, you mentioned black hole, and there's a lot of controversy. Could you tell us what your research shows um, the black hole really is? Uh, sure. Um, well, you know, what we have, you know, conventional physics basically has Einstein's theory of gravity, which is called general relativity. That's our, our mainstay theory of gravity. And in the late 30s, people began looking at this theory and asking what would happen if the star or the sun that's causing the gravitational field became uh, really, really small, really uh, heavy, but small. So it's concentrated mass. And they realized that Einstein's equations showed something very weird, that you would reach a point where light would go into this area, but it couldn't get back out. And um, so that, that was the discovery, or at least the theoretical discovery, of a black hole. Uh, the problem is that um, when things start falling into it, since light can't get out very well, um, it's hard, you can't really see it. So you have to kind of uh, infer from things happening around it that what you have is probably a black hole. And that means basically things, as things fall into it, they speed up. They give off radiation, and you have to kind of look for that radiation and try to argue that it's probably a black hole. Um, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, that basic idea is, still holds up pretty well. Uh, scientists have learned that if it's spinning, if it's uh, rotating, as most of them do, then things happen somewhat differently. Um, so, uh, you know, at, at the present time, we have a whole bunch of candidate black holes, including uh, ones at the center of our, of our galaxy and other galaxies, we think they're probably black holes. They certainly behave like them. Uh, without falling into one, uh, you could never be sure 100%, and, um, and then you couldn't tell anybody. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, we should just throw some cameras up there, you know. <laughs> I don't know how well, long the they'd last, but I I'm kind of one yeah. of those curious... E yeah, well, put them on, like you. Put them on a long cord. <laughs> yeah, I just I, I want to know. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's really fascinating. I, I think it's amazing. Um, you actually uh, uh, started your own consulting company um, that carried out studies in these applied physics for uh, governmental agencies, Army, Navy, uh, DARPA, and CIA. Can you talk about some of these studies that um, you got to participate in? Sure. Um, what after grad school, um, I, I really kind of wanted to. 
I was conflicted because I was very interested in uh, some of the um, very fundamental physics studies, but I realized that um, I'd, I'd have a lot better chance if I had a practical job in the daytime. So I began doing uh, <laughs> consulting work with a little company in Princeton called ARAP, which stands for Aeronautical Research Associates of Princeton. And this company had been uh, doing defense consulting for 20 or 30 years. Uh, their specialty was hydrodynamics, which is the flow of, of fluids, either water or air, and um, vortexes and things like that. Uh, and, and you know when you're a, when you think you're a, a smart physicist and you think you know a lot and then you're suddenly thrust into an area where people are working with fluids, you, I, I kind of thought, well, this will be easy because I know the basic equation for a fluid, so it's all you know kind of obvious. And what I found out very quickly is that fluids are very complicated. They have turbulence, they have vortexes. You could look at tornadoes out there, you know, which have been coming kind of close to uh, Colorado and Kansas the past couple of weeks. And you can yeah. see the, the kind of co complicated flows that you can, ha you can have in a, in a fluid or a gas. Uh, so I began realizing very quickly that this was, there was a lot more to it. And uh, so it was, a, it was a wonderful education. Um, after a few years, I decided, well, I wanted to be able to do some inventions and more entrepreneurial, so I started my own company and uh, did consulting with, with more or less the same agencies. Um, I was situated in the Washington, D.C. area, so, you know, to get government contracts, you kind of, uh, you kind of pound the pavement and go door to door and make presentations, and every so often you get a contract. Um, and I was working mostly following up on the earlier work in fluids, uh, looking at vortexes and the flow, uh, mostly in the ocean, trying to understand how the ocean behaves. And we had some contacts with the Navy on uh, finding uh, ships and submarines and what radar does when it sh bounces off the surface and what, you know things like that. Um, so that kind of made a living for me for many years. And... Uh, Meanwhile, I began learning about some of these, these other strange phenomena that uh, told me that there was a whole lot more to physics than I'd learned in school. And um, I just began very intensely sort of on the side trying to learn as much as I could. So um, it, I, I sort of wow. had a dual life there for a number of years. So that background possibly led to your investigation into uh, unconventional physics so-called unconventional <laughs> well the one thing that it helped me understand is probably government secrecy and how classified <laughs> programs work you know because uh, you know we have this economy and this scientific establishment where you know we have open science that's published in scientific journals and then we have sort of secret science that's uh, kept in big corporations and defense department studies and things like that and the two don't talk to each other as much as they should, uh, so that I, I've discovered how effectively things can be kept secret. And, you know, so it, it helped when you get into some of the strange areas. Sometimes you can understand a little bit better what's going on if you've kind of seen things from the other side. Um, but it, it, was, it was very exciting for me because uh, what I found is almost every strange phenomenon that I had been told was a hoax and I was told is not real actually is real. You know, that ESP and remote viewing and uh, affecting things at a distance with your mind, which they call PK or psychokinesis, uh, these are all real things. You know, they, they actually have been verified now to quite high probabilities. And even more than that, I began realizing, well, wait a minute, if all these things are possible, and then what you learn is, well, uh, there are lots of accounts of levitation and uh, other things like that. And you say, well, what about UFOs? Um, if you had technology and understood how these things work, well, maybe even UFOs could be real. So I began looking into that. And it's, it's kind of strange when you have a degree and you kind of think you know how the universe works. And then every time you check into some new area, you keep finding out, uh, no, it left out something. It left out something kind of important. So um, it's been very exciting. <laughs>
And what, when you first started, um, your, well, your interest in this and publishing works, how did your um, uh, colleagues take it? W were they surprised that you started believing these things that you were taught in school maybe weren't real? Well, you know, I I pretty well understand how they feel, and I don't really, I, I don't really see too much advantage to talking to them about the strange areas. You know, I think that what's kind of happened is that scientists are now in two camps. There is there is the, the majority are probably still in the mainstream camp, which means that things in physical review uh, are the reality, and things that don't don't get published in a mainstream journal. Uh, never happen. Uh, that seems to be true in America anyway. Uh, but at the same time, there are who are, <clears throat> are sensing that there is something more, and so there are several alternative societies and alternative journals that have sprung up, and uh, one of them I belong to is called Society for Scientific Exploration, or SSE. Another one is called ICEAM, which is a long acronym that's they said they study subtle energy. There's Noetic Society and a variety of other organizations. And here you find uh, very highly credentialed uh, PhDs doing research, but they're doing research on these weird areas, uh, ESP, psychic phenomena, distant healing, things like that. So our science today is kind of has two tracks. And uh, I think instead of trying to go back to the mainstream and convince them, you just kind of wait for them to figure out that they're missing something and come join our society. Well, just so you know, you are on Truth Brigade Radio, and none of this is weird. Um, <laughs> we, we've accepted it as a totally natural, normal uh, way of life. Um, <laughs> so you're in good company here. But what, do, what would you think, that the profession of Ph.D. scientists, physicists, is it about split 50-50, say? I, I have not tried to do any polling. My guess oh, is okay. <laughs> my, my, my guess is the majority is still in the old camp. That would be my my guess. And and one one reason for that is funding that the government controls a lot of the funding. And whatever research goes on in these strange areas happens in very secret programs where you never really hear about it. So all the open. Uh, research, the government funds, um, you know, avoid these areas. All right, Dr. Swanson, uh, hold that thought. We're going to take a short break here. You're listening to Truth Brigade Radio with Dr. Claude Swanson. You're to Truth Brigade Radio on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. If you want to join us at the text chat, head over to TruthBrigade.com. And the number to call tonight is 512-879-3800. Three eight zero five. Our special guest tonight, Dr. Claude Swanson, a PhD physicist, just the most incredible, fascinating background. Um, also, the author of the Synchronized Universe. Uh, head over to synchronizeduniverse.com to find out more about that. Um, Wow, your your background is so amazing. I'm wondering if you're going to be able to share some of those uh, secret projects with us. And just so you know, I won't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Christy. <laughs> Well, well, you know, know I, I don't know about everyone listening. I don't know if they'll tell anyone, but yeah. you know, I what, won't. what I what I what I have found <laughs> what I have found. This is the truth: is that the most interesting stuff that goes on in the world is not the secret stuff. It, it's the the it's the op, the openly available information. There's much more exciting stuff there. Um, I mean. <laughs> I mean, just take, for example, remote viewing, okay? I mean, that was a secret government program for 20 years. It ended in 1993 you know, or four, somewhere in the mid-'90s. And, and then uh, the people who've been involved in it uh, all disbanded, and they set up schools, uh, schools to begin teaching other people. Um, and uh, one of them was Ed Dames, who taught... Courtney Brown, and I took three remote viewing courses with Courtney Brown when it became available so anybody could do it. 
and uh, he still has his school down in Atlanta called Farsight. There are a variety of other schools um, around the country, different remote viewers teach, and uh, you can really uh, have some amazing experiences that show you uh, directly from experience that your mind uh, is much greater than your body. Your mind, your mind can go anywhere. You can access virtually any kind of information you want to. The procedures are straightforward, and they kind of help you to get involved in the target. And I'm not sure how familiar, I expect your, your listeners have heard about remote viewing, but I'll just give you a quick rundown, if that's okay, um, of, um, of how I, what, what I learned about it. Um, the procedure, basically, is you're given some numbers or some very abstract way of designating a target. The target may be, for example, the destruction of the dinosaurs, okay, as an example, or uh, the sinking of the Titanic. That's written down on a piece of paper, which is put in an envelope somewhere else. On the outside of the envelope are some numbers. So then you're given these numbers. That's all you have. And your psychic ability, your your subconscious mind, has to make contact with that target. You have your conscious mind has no ability to you know figure out from logic what you're going after, and that's a good thing. That helps you to tune in. So it's a, it's a step by step set of procedures that takes you closer and closer to linking with the target. Uh, and I, I consider myself kind of an average remote viewer, I've met some really good ones, but uh, even the average ones, after maybe a few minutes to a half an hour or so, you start to hone in on the target, you get more and more detail, and pretty soon you're having visceral experiences, you're having emotions, you're having physical reactions. Uh, in, in my Titanic uh, target, I was uh, lost for a while, I didn't know where I was, I, I thought I saw something flat. I thought it was the desert. Then I realized it was probably the ocean. I saw this ship with the, uh, the, 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 the uh, keel or one end of it up in the air. I saw people sliding on this wet metal deck. I heard the sound of metal buckling. Then I thought I was in the water looking at this thing at night. And then suddenly I realized Titanic. That's what I was watching as it went down. And so when you do a remote viewing session like that, in a sense, you're really there. A part of your consciousness uh, goes there uh, if it's a good session. And uh, I've had maybe eight or ten out of maybe about 20 or 30 percent were, were that kind of vivid connections where uh, afterwards you, you feel like you know something. You feel like you actually were there. And so that's interesting, number one. It, it gives you a, some indication of why the military found it so interesting. Uh, the Princeton Pear Lab uh, which was run by Professor Robert John of the engineering department. He used to be head of the engineering department at Princeton. Uh, they ran thousands and thousands of experiments with people doing tests like this, and they found the accuracy of these tests far exceeded chance. And that means that psychic phenomena are real. They've been proven by science. And at the present time, the Princeton Pear Lab, when they put together all their data over 30 years, for remote viewing, psychokinesis, um, ESP, and put it all together, the odds are trillions to one that it could just be chance. In other words, it's overwhelming. It's one of the best demonstrated phenomena we have. And so that tells us that the human mind is greater than the body, is able to reach out, go to these places. The time doesn't matter. Distance doesn't matter. Uh, Professor John, when he was doing these studies, uh, has this wonderful quote that, uh, you know, that, that this force that enables us to connect with distant objects or people uh, does not weaken the distance. It's just as great when the people are 10,000 miles away as when they're in the same room. It, it does not care about time shifts. It can shift forward or backward in time. So it's unlike any force known to physics. So that's what got me interested because this is exciting new science. This is a revolution in physics. And, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of time for our science. You know, they had these, these guys get on the TV and they, they, they spout off about string theory and stuff like that. 
and they never mention these exciting experiments that show that our current science is missing something. So, anyway, and Absolutely. <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate it. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Simeon Hein on the show, uh, MountBaldi.com, mm-hmm. and yep. he, you know, he described when he first heard of this, he's thinking, okay, well, yeah, right, uh, that's everything. You know, that goes against everything I learned getting my Ph.D. And so he just decided, well, what the heck? You know, if it's real, I'll find out. If it's not, then I'll find out and signed up, took a course. And, you know, he became a believer. I mean, was it like that for you? You had to see it to believe it and experience it yourself? No. uh, I'm unlike a lot of the people who have gone into these fields uh, because I'm pretty left-brained and pretty research-oriented I tend to read lots of books and papers and talk to people beforehand so I I figure out the thing is real usually from the left-brained research uh, direction and then usually I, I want to go experience it just to see if I can do it um, because you know for left brain uh, PhDs who've had a lot of education uh, it's, it's often more difficult to let go of all those preconceptions, you know, and just let your subconscious mind take you where you, it wants to. That's yeah. kind of difficult, which is one of the problems with convincing scientists that this stuff is real. Um, so usually that's kind of the, the last step in the process for me. I already had seen enough data to know it was real before I did it. But, uh, but Simeon was actually one of my teachers because Simeon was an assistant to Courtney Brown. He was one of the teaching assistants in the Farsight program when I took my courses there. And that was before he oh, wow. set up his, his own school. So I've known Simeon uh, for quite a while. And uh, also when I went, I went to the crop circles in 99 with Ron Russell and Simeon, they ran some tours out there, and uh, I met them out there too. So we, we keep bumping into each other. We have very similar interests. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, my goodness, your your principal interest has been the unified field field theory, or the so-called theory of everything. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, sure. That that's that was really the holy grail, I guess, that got me into this uh, line of research. And uh, at the present time, it seems like a lot of the, of, this, of the science that I was looking for has been worked out. Um, I discovered that um, a group of Russian scientists, um, starting starting back in the 1950s, um, uh, with one man named Nikolai Kozarev, uh, uh, probably have figured out the key ingredient that explains a lot of paranormal phenomena and a lot of consciousness phenomena. And in other words, they figured out what what the science is behind all the weird stuff, uh, and and they call it torsion. That's one name for it, torsion. Um, and another one, another name for it is density of time. And I, I guess I got interested in this a long time ago when I read this wonderful classic book, Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain, by uh, Sheila Ostrander and Lynn Schroeder, which was first published in 1970. Um, they had gone over to Czechoslovakia, Eastern Europe, and Russia in the late 60s when there was a momentary thaw in the Cold War and interviewed scientists over there who were working on these fields. One of the people they interviewed was Nikolai Kozarev, uh, an astrophysicist, uh, very respected at the time in Russia, who had come up with these ideas about the density of time and uh, he really felt this was the key to explaining ESP and other psychic phenomena. So it's a, it's a fast, they have a whole chapter about him in that early book, which is almost 40 years ago. Um, and that intrigued me, you know, and you, you want to know more, but there wasn't more at the time. When the Soviet Union fell apart in 1991 or thereabouts with Glasnost and Perestroika, uh, more papers came out. And it turns out there was a huge program going on in Russia investigating and doing research on these subjects. So uh, as, far as, as far as I can tell, it's kind of hard to get the whole picture, 
but it seems like they probably had a pretty well developed science of this subject. So um, I've been trying to piece together for their understanding and uh, put it together with my own intuition and, and come up with a you know a, a point of view that makes sense to me. But um, I think they're, they're really the leaders in terms of the scientific uh, basis for these forces. So your book, The Synchronized Universe, I mean, you've compiled a ton of evidence that this, you know, uh, so-called paranormal uh, exists. I mean, it, it not only exists, it's been proven with science. Um, however, there are some uh, barriers. Hopefully this will uh, hopefully lessen the divide uh, between uh, science and religion. But I, I, it seems, you know, based on our past shows, that, that a lot of these limitations are self-imposed. Yeah, I mean, I used to wonder when I was a kid about life after death and, you know, the soul and things like that. And the answer that conventional religion gives is don't ask questions, just believe, you know, which mm -hmm. if you have a scientific mind is not very satisfactory. Uh, you want to understand. And I've been very excited to find out that these new forces, we call it torsion or density of time or whatever name you want to give it, uh, appears to be the missing ingredient. Uh, it, it, it has what physicists call a non, they're nonlinear fields. Uh, you might call them gauge fields. What that, what that means is they act kind of like gravity in the sense that if you have one of these fields and it gets pretty strong, it can begin to attract more of the same energy to it. Uh, so the, the like, there are actually two polarities of this field. There's a right spinning and a left spinning a torsion field, and the right spinning attracts more of itself, the left spinning more of itself. So what can happen is you can create an energy ball out of pure torsion energy. Uh, and it interacts with consciousness, and from what the Russians say, it may be consciousness itself. So think of the orbs that people photograph, you know? Yeah. Uh, think of uh, the orbs that are seen leaving the body at time of death. Hello, uh, Dr. Swanson, hold that thought. Uh, we are rolling into the radio on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. If you want to join us for the text chat, head over to truthbrigade.com and check out some of these links. Once again, our special guest, Dr. Claude Swanson, synchronizeduniverse.com to learn more about him and uh, in the incredible book, The Synchronized Universe. I can hardly wait for your next book. Um, but before we went into the break, you mentioned orbs, and that's uh, another one of those things you have me curious about. I, I you know, I... <laughs> I would love for somebody to, you know, I read all these conflicting things of what they are on the Internet. I've taken photos of them myself. In fact, I have photos where my dog was, she acted like she was talking to someone, okay, playing with mm -hmm. someone or something. All I saw was air, but I decided to get my camera and take photos. Um, because, you know, I wanted to see if the camera would show me. And sure uh -huh. enough, you see orbs, you see them in motion. You, it's just amazing. So what are these orbs? What is it we're looking at? Um, well, okay, first of all, of course, people have to be, have to be aware that a lot of orbs that, they, that you can take are artifacts. You know, you can, get, you can get things that look like orbs from dust near the camera or water droplets. Or, or a lens flare, which means a bright light off of your, just off of the field of view. I, I off. promise it was not dust or water. No, I, I believe that. <laughs> I believe that. I have a number of real ones too. Uh, so, so that's one thing. Um, I, yeah, I, I think that most of them are out of body uh, consciousnesses of various types. I mean, uh, some are human, some are non-human. Um, uh, I'll give you some a couple of data points to support uh, what I say. Um, number one, experiments were done with Keith Harari many years ago. He's a uh, parapsychologist and also 
um, a very adept at going out of body himself, he did two kinds of experiments. Um, uh, number one, he had a little kitten that, um, you know, cats are pretty good at seeing these things too. He had a little kitten they put out in, in the field in a box and they had the whole thing, uh, on the, on the, on the, uh, floor of the box, uh, marked off and they counted how often the kitten meowed and how often the kitten paced from one square to another. And of course the kitten was disturbed so it would keep on pacing and keep on meowing. But whenever Keith Arari went into a trance, went out of body, and went to comfort the kitten, the kitten stopped. It stopped meowing, stopped moving. And they had scientific data that showed like within 100 to 1, there was a dramatic difference when he went out of body. So the kitten knew he was there. Uh, in one experiment, he went to visit his dentist's office, I believe it was, and the dentist reported seeing a small uh, one or two inch diameter reddish orb flitting around the office at the time that Harari was visiting in an OBE. Um, so it's, uh, there's a variety of, of, of data like that that suggest that when we're out of body, that what we look like uh, is an orb. Uh, so that's how the consciousness appears. Uh, I also did uh, some experiments with um, a ghost hunter here in, uh, in Colorado uh, Christopher Moon uh, in the basement of the house he grew up in. Uh, there are lots of orbs there, which is probably what got him involved in it. Uh, so we're, we're in the middle of this pitch black basement of the house. I'm not seeing much of anything on my camera. We had we both had Sony Night Shot uh, video cameras, which I'll look at the near infrared. And Christopher is seeing a whole bunch of orbs because his eyes are much quicker to picking them up when they flit across the screen. And after 30 or 40 minutes of this, I get frustrated and I say, Hey, Christopher, I haven't seen anything yet. So he announces into the darkness, Would an orb please show up for Claude's camera? Within about one or two seconds, a bright orb about one inch in, one inch in diameter, 20 feet away, dead in the middle of my view screen, popped in, just flicked in, and then very leisurely, for about two seconds, it sort of sauntered toward me and off to the right. So, uh, and and that plus a lot of the accounts that Christopher told me about uh, convinced me that these are consciousness. They respond to our desires in some cases. Uh, and um, I think that there are a variety of different types of orbs, not just human uh, out-of-body consciousnesses or uh, out of or or the in some cases people who have departed and come back. Christopher told me that uh, in that basement there was a portal, and every day at a certain time there'd be a snap, and just hundreds of orbs would appear and start streaming out of this portal and then come back in at a later time, which suggested that these might be uh, uh, consciousnesses or uh, beings from who have already left, who have already departed, but coming back to visit for one reason or another. Um, but then some orbs are huge. Um, I have a photograph taken by a friend of mine of a three-foot diameter orb in daylight. Uh, it has reflections of things around it, of uh, the sun. It's, it's, it's uh, about four in the afternoon. It has also things you can see through it. Um, so they range in size and probably in intelligence, depending on... Uh, what the nature of the consciousness was that created it. Uh, Brazilian researchers are very familiar with these, and I think they have a name for it. It's like a camera lens. They feel it's, it's like a lens for someone from some other dimension to peer into our dimension, and it's like the portal that allows them to do that. Wow. Amazing. You know, uh, Dr. Swanson, I, I'm going to send you an email with the link to where you can see the photos that I was talking about. I would love for us uh, to press next time again. We're going into a short break here. We'll be back at the top of the hour with Dr. Claude Swanson on Truth Brigade Radio. Come back. You're listening to Truth Brigade Radio on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. The text chat over at truthbrigade.com. Um, Dr. Claude Swanson, this is a, a very short segment here, 
So I'll just ask you a quick question, and, and we'll elaborate more um, in our next segment. But uh, one of the things you talk about is um, the energy fields and energy healers and orgone and organite, uh, bioenergy and stuff. But if you could, we have a few minutes here. Tell us a little bit about orgone. Uh, well, orgone is a type of energy that is connected with the energy of life. There's a special form of energy which is, plays a crucial role in all living things. It's essential to life. It probably uh, works to help reduce entropy, which is a physicist or a scientific name for the randomness of lost energy. So and it helps make things more efficient. Uh, this type of energy has been discovered and rediscovered over and over again by many cultures. It's what the Chinese call qi. Okay? It's what, when a Reiki healer uh, holds hands over your body and you feel warmth, that's the same energy. It's being directed into your body. It looks as though the human intelligence is able to interact with this energy and direct it. That's what makes it really important. Uh, it, it, it's been uh, discovered by uh, the Germans. Uh, Wilhelm Reich uh, called it uh, Orgone. Uh, uh, Victor Schauberger uh, worked with it in his water experiments. Before that, there was a, a German researcher named Baron von Reichenbach. For 40 years, he did experiments to determine the nature of this energy. Uh, that is the life force. That's what my second book is about, and uh, that's what the Russians call torsion. To me, the big uh, project right now for science is to understand this force and integrate it into our science. And uh, this is the key, I think, to including consciousness in physics. Okay, so I, it's one of those things, again, we know it works. I personally know it works. Uh, but here's the biggie. Do we know why it works? Um, well, I, I think so. Um, how many minutes do I have to explain that? <laughs> you know, oh, gosh, we only have a minute now, but we'll definitely pick it back up on the other okay, well, side. Well, let me just say that one thing we know is that the vacuum, what we call the vacuum of space, is actually filled with energy. Okay, it's called the zero-point energy. There's lots of energy there. This is where torsion exists. It's found there in abundance, and uh, it really is sort of an underlying matrix for our reality. It's present in everything that happens, and it's sort of the... But by looking at it, by measuring it, by taking it into account, we have a whole new appreciation for what the true nature of reality is. Okay. Well, that's fair enough that's... for a one-minute explanation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I do you have... I actually, um, there was a listener that uh, sent me some organite, and, you know, I'll give my quick little brief story of what happened, but I was in a wheelchair at the time. I popped this stuff out of the package, put it on, put it next to my computer in bed, and the next day I was ready to go run a marathon. So I'm wow. still not sure how that happened. That's the right back here on Truth to Truth Brigade Radio on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Our special guest tonight, Dr. Claude Swanson, author of The Synchronized Universe. You can find more about that at synchronizeduniverse.com and purchase a copy or a video. Uh, Dr. Claude Swanson just does a wonderful job at explaining this in terms that, hey, even I could understand. <laughs> so if you want to join us for the text chat, that's over at truthbrigade.com. And the number to call if you have any questions or comments is 512-879-3805. So Dr. Swanson, I shared my 15-second uh, success story Um I mean, literally, I was in a wheelchair. Could I had no use of 
any of my limbs, literally. My, my children had to feed me, and I was at a point in time where if they told me to go, you know, eat a sparrow's foot, you know, in my front yard, I would have done it. I, I, you know, so I figured it was pretty simple just putting these little things next to my bed, my desk, and to wear around my neck. Um, in fact, there were times where, you know, I took a shower and forgot to put it back on, and one time in particular I left town for five days. By the time I came back, I could hardly walk again. I mean, I was in a lot of pain. So what's going on here? Why, why this wonderful benefit from this? Well, it, it looks like there are a couple of things that, that this energy does. The organite is one way of collecting this energy. It's around us all the time. The sun uh, beams it onto the planet, uh, but certain uh, objects and materials are good at collecting it and concentrating it, and that's what Wilhelm Reich discovered with his organ accumulator, and that's what organite seems to do. Uh, it is the same energy that flows in our acupuncture meridians, as far as I can tell. Uh, and so when you add some extra energy of this type, then the acupuncture meridians, which are all through the body, and they carry, uh, they carry signals, and they also carry energy to all the various organs. So uh, when this energy gets added, uh, what happens with illness is a lot of times this energy flow within the body. The Chinese call it qi, uh, which flows uh, from points on the skin through, through these channels inside the body to various organs. Uh, when that is not strong enough, when something is blocking it, uh, that usually is connected with illness. So I think the organite probably is giving you more of what the Chinese would call qi, which then ramps up the acupuncture meridians, which in turn tell the body, uh, hey, you know, this is how you're supposed to look. Uh, one, one thing that we've learned about acupuncture and the whole Chinese medicine um, system is that it's now been verified by science. Um, people have been able to have now photographed the acupuncture meridians. Uh, we've actually been able to follow this energy as it flows through them, uh, and it, it appears as though what they one thing they carry is a little hologram, a template of the body, including every organ within it. When that template is strong, then the cells know how to behave to keep the organs growing and healing correctly. When the template is weak then the body tends to lose sight of the blueprint and we have illness. So I think organite, by supplying orgone or, or chi, uh, strengthens that template and kind of, you know, reminds the body, hey, look, you know, here's more energy to show you this template. Get with it. Get back in balance. And it tells, directs the cells to behave properly to do so. So it's one way of explaining what it does. Well, you know what? It works for me. So, <laughs> I, I well, exactly. Just, wow, <laughs> it, it's nice to understand a little bit, though. Um, you know, and maybe you know. I mean, that's what it takes so that we can explain it and hopefully help others. So, I, I really appreciate all of your research and compiled together at one spot, synchronizeduniverse dot com. Um, you, you just did a wonderful job. You know, there's so many other things to talk about. I definitely want to talk about uh, teleportation and levitation and uh, out-of-body experiences, but we do have a caller on the line. So our first call, it looks like uh, Nurse Olivia. Welcome to the show. Hi, Christy and Dr. Swanson, and I heard you talking about the organite, Christy, and so that was exciting to hear you give your personal testimonial about that. Um, well, you, now, you were, in fact, list. Nurse Olivia, you were the one uh, that did this for me, so I have to thank you. Well, what can I say? I, I uh, have benefited so much from, from you as well and from listening to your incredible guests such as uh, Dr. Swanson, so it's the least I can do, Christy, and I'm just, you know, really, really happy that I was uh, able to, <clears throat> to to have that sent to you when you needed it. So, Thank um, you. 
But the, I've got a little bit of a problem here, Christy. I have a list of questions for Dr. Swanson, and I don't want to be selfish because I know you have questions for him, and there might be other callers, and so uh, I need you to limit me. Why don't you give me a number of questions that I'm allowed to ask? <laughs> Olivia, you can have all the time in the world. Oh, well, my gosh. all the time we have. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Swanson, it's certainly an honor to um, to speak with you. And um, as Christy mentioned, I am a nurse, and uh, like you, <laughs> I, I started realizing, gee, maybe what I was taught in school isn't the best way. And I also have uh, gone outside of the conventional box of my field. Um, I've read the trilogy from Bob Monroe, and also the trilogy from Dr. Thomas Campbell, uh, and I'm sure you're uh, you're obviously familiar with those. Uh, I would like to ask you some questions, especially based on uh, Dr. Campbell's work. Uh, first of all, could you please <laughs> sum up for us um, what you consider what your research has has uh, shown you to be the origin of life? Where did we come from, and why are we here? Okay, I I know Bob Monroe's work. I've read his books, and I've been to the Monroe Institute a couple different times. I don't know Thomas Campbell's work, so can you tell me a little bit about what he says? Sure. Well, uh, Dr. Campbell wrote a trilogy called My Big Toe, Theory of Everything, and I know you've oh, also developed okay. a theory of everything. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, and, and um, it's, uh, what can I say, it was a life-changing experience and mind-bending to read his trilogy. I don't think it's been out that many years, actually. It's fairly new. But uh, he came up with this new paradigm that basically evolution is like, uh, that it's running like a machine that's not going to stop, that it just has to keep going. And, and um, one of the things that I loved most about his work was that he said that um, our focus in this life, the, the whole reason we came here, first of all, we did choose to come here, and we're here because we need to expand our consciousness, and the whole purpose of life, which, you know, most people think that it's to watch television and to sit back and, you know, eat hot dogs and go America and July 4th fireworks, you know, but that our, what we really need to be focusing on is we came to this planet to expand our consciousness, and that's our responsibility in that we need to continue evolving with all life. Yeah, uh, and I, I'm and really, I, I, really curious what you have to say about sure. that. Oh, I, I totally agree. I mean, that, that point of view, of course, uh, he didn't invent that. That has been passed down from sages and uh, wise people in, you know, India and um, every all, all kinds of uh, masters and sages have have told us that, and I totally agree with it. Um, I, I do have his books actually. I haven't read them yet, but they're sitting on my bookshelf. And um, but I, but I totally agree with that basic uh, premise. One of the things that I have been trying to do is build a bridge between sort of the Western materialistic view and the the, the scientist and this more spiritual perspective, you know. And and so what I can add is that when you start looking at uh, my synchronized universe model in my book, which is in the last chapter of my book, which purports to explain some of these things, uh, and also the, the Russian torsion stuff, which I'll be describing in the next book, what you learn is that the the energy and the forces that are kind of right here where you and I are sitting, uh, they actually are connected with um, uh, distant matter far away. The rest of the cosmos uh, is actually exchanging energy with us all the time, and there are effects from that interaction. So we are in contact with the distant universe in the future and in the past, and they all kind of come together to determine what goes on. And why that's important is, uh, if you if you read uh, Michael Talbot's wonderful book, The Holographic Universe, which talks about how the brain uh, processes holographically uh, my work has kind of extended that by saying, hey, look, if we, 
Are we okay? Okay. I'm hearing background noise. Hello? Yeah, I'm hearing an echo. Christy? Okay. I'm well, hearing... you know, good news. I'm here. I hope you can hear me okay, but I had one of yeah, those you, little internet issues again. Oh, okay. Um, you're, 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 okay, well, let me just continue then. I, I was just as long as you can hear okay. So um, well, the bottom line is that the space around us actually... The vacuum of space is not empty. It has energy in it. And that energy can support patterns, uh, which then can direct growth and control how things happen. And that's the piece that's missing from current physics. Um, and that's what's called the subtle energy. That's what's called the aura. That's what's called chi. It's the nature of how these patterns in the vacuum can be important. They can direct how our body grows, how we send thoughts from one person to another. It's through this matrix of background back patterns, which are actually in contact with the rest of the universe. And uh, that's how the Hindus have this concept called the Akashic Record, which is that nothing is ever forgotten, that we can access any event that's ever happened, all the knowledge is available to us if we go into an altered state. Well, the way it's maintained is in this distant matter, in these vibrations that connect us with the rest of the matter in the universe. So what I've been trying to do is put together a physics model that explains how a lot of these paranormal and esoteric ideas, including the soul, you know, can, can really be explained and understood uh, by physics. The physics will just kind of grow up and start taking consciousness seriously. Um, but I, I certainly agree with the basic idea you're talking about. Well, um, you mentioned that that energy, um, that's the chi energy that you're talking about, is that right? Uh, yeah, that's one name for it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you mentioned that energy is uh, is responsible for our growth. So does that mean that that energy is helping to direct our lives and put us in the situations that we need to be in to help us expand our consciousness? Yes. In, in other words, um, our, our minds, our human minds, our thoughts, our ideas, things we focus on also shape the pattern of this energy around us. It shapes the, the field of torsion, the field of chi, the field of subtle energy around us. We can actually change that, uh, change the shape of that field by focusing on it. If there's something we really want, something that's very important to us, we form an image of what we seek and hold it very strongly while going into an altered state where we get coherence, where the vibrations in the body all vibrate together, which is called, that's what coherence is. And that is how we interact with that field. And when we start to change the field, then we can attract things we're looking for into our life, uh, even change ourselves. So uh, it's, it's really that mind-body interaction that, um, you know, you hear lots of people talking about it, but I think now uh, we're starting to find that the science can even explain how it happens. Okay. Um, did that, did I, that, did, that didn't do it for you, did it? <laughs> well, what, oh, that's, I mean, what, what's well, that's what okay. That? I have, um, you know, that, well, I mean, obviously I'm learning from everything that you're saying. Um, I, I have a, another question along the same lines, and that is that um, what I've learned through the work of Robert Monroe and Dr. Campbell is that there are aliens or, you know, aliens and beings um, that, are like, that are more like ourselves that are um, very involved in uh, our, each one of our individual evolutionary process and, and um, I just wanted, I was real curious, because you had mentioned UFOs. You, you said that you became open to the possibility, well, that, you know, maybe that's true, and you said you did investigate that. 
So, uh, and I know you did some secret things and <laughs> were connected with Washington. So, um, you know, we've heard a lot on Truth Brigade about uh, aliens working in the Pentagon and, and being very, very much a part of what what's controlling what happens in Washington. And so I would just be real curious to know if you've had any personal confirmation about things such as that. Well, I, I, I was lucky in a way that none of my classified work ever had anything to do with the woo-woo or the weird stuff. It was mostly <laughs> about... Yeah. <laughs> it was mostly about submarines and, you know, tracking them and finding them and stuff like that. So uh, it, it didn't have anything to do with those things. Um, and I think if I had, then it would probably be much harder for me to talk about it or to do research on it because I would have had to sign some kind of agreement. So uh, in a way, I think I'm lucky that I never got involved in, in anything like that. Um, but what happened was I began doing lots of research, reading lots of books, talking to researchers, talking to experiencers, and at this point I've had a couple of sightings of my own as well, but I didn't really need that. I'd talked to so many people and gathered so much evidence that, you know, I, I, you know, I knew they were real. Um, but uh, as far as the, the big picture of what, is going on. That's really one of the really most interesting aspects of the whole learning process. Uh, you mentioned Monroe Institute, and uh, one thing that they teach is that you know there is a hierarchy of dimensions. We're living Dr. in a. Dr. Johnson, could you please yes. hold that thought and take this back on the other side, Olivia? If we want to hold, if you want to hold, I'll make sure to bring you back up and at least get this question out of the way. Be right back. Truth Brigade. Radio. You're listening to Truth Brigade Radio on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Our special guest, Dr. Claude Swanson, author of The Synchronized Universe. You can get your copy at synchronizeduniverse.com and if you want to join us in the text chat head over to truthbrigade.com um, uh, Dr. Swanson uh, it looks like Olivia is still here so if you would uh, please continue and Olivia you don't have to worry about any other callers it's uh, just Louis B and he said he will be patient <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Yeah, so let me let me answer the question that happened before the commercial. But um, also, if people have trouble spelling uh, synchronized universe, uh, if you just Google put Claude Swanson, C L A U D E Swanson into Google, I think my website pops up first. So it may be yep. an easier way for you to find it. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> um, as, as in terms of uh, of ETs and Monroe Institute, uh, what I found very helpful with Monroe, you know, there's the, a the process there for people who haven't been, is you have hemisync tapes, which put frequencies into your two ears so that they mix together and there's a difference frequency, which is a very slow frequency that matches your brain waves. And it helps your brain to go into uh, deep meditative states, the alpha, the delta, the theta. Uh, and so uh, it helps make it easier to have altered state experiences. And at Monroe, they have special little booths. Each person has his own little check booth with a little curtain in the hall. And it's all quiet and dark in there to help you go into altered states while you listen to the music. Uh, and when you do that, the music and the sounds help you go into higher dimensions, send your consciousness into levels above the normal physical. And uh, in some, some of those levels, you may encounter uh, beings that are not human but have consciousness also, and you can explore... Uh, what they are like, and you can also explore the after death uh, levels where the soul goes. There's a variety of different levels that kind of help you to uh, become familiar with uh, other dimensions besides our good old three three space and one time dimension. Uh, one of the things I've learned from that experience and other research is that a lot of these ETs appear to be. Uh, they're very much like 
uh, the wise men, uh, the adepts, the masters that you may read about, say Yogananda uh, in India, the, the yogi who came to America in the 30s. Um, they're, they're very similar to some of those people. Their, their messages are very similar. They are very good at going into trance, very good at t- sending their consciousness into these higher dimensions where they say that's, that's where most of the interesting stuff, that's where most of the action really is. Uh, the universe has more dimensions than just the ones we perceive here. Uh, and we're kind of on the bottom rung of the ladder, uh, and there's actually a lot more space out there, or more planets, a lot more life in the higher dimensions. So one of the goals of our life here is to learn the lessons that we can learn here and we retain the lessons in the form of modifying our higher dimensional body so that we become prepared for, you know, for experiencing those higher dimensions. And uh, there's a wonderful chapter 43 in Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi, where his teacher has been dead for, you know, weeks or months, and Yogananda was not present when he died. And he's in his hotel room or his room grieving, thinking about this. And there's a poof, and his master, Sri Yukteswar, appeared out of thin air. And he was solid. Yogananda could touch him, could hug him, could smell him. Um, and the, and the, his master tells him about these higher dimensions where he's been for the past several weeks and gives a wonderful description of what the higher dimensions are like. Uh, to me, uh, a lot of the ETs are from civilizations that have learned how to get over violence. They've learned how to get over ego and aggression. They've learned how to uh, have access to very powerful technological tools and not misuse them. And that's why they tend to be more spiritually advanced than we are. If we get past this stage, it'll only be because we have managed to access that spiritual information and behave responsibly toward weapons, toward power, toward technology, and toward our planet. You know, and if we don't get, you know, get past it, then we'll destroy ourselves, destroy our planet, and that's kind of Darwinian evolution happening on the planetary scale. So, um, I think a lot of these beings are here uh, to help in much the same way that we would help an injured cat or an injured uh, dog. We feel empathy. Some of them are cousins of ours, I believe. Uh, that's why they, 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 some of them look a lot like us, even if they're not exactly like us. But, you know, there's empathy there. There's the desire to help. Uh, and also, they probably know what many people here know which is it's our good deeds, it's our good action, it's our helping of others, our learning to love others, that is how we advance. Um, you know, that's the law of karma, and uh, that, that's a universal law. In fact, in my second book, I talk about this wonderful ex- experiment done by a professor at the University of California, Irvine, with healing, with, in which he actually shows that karma has a measurable effect. It's now being proved scientifically in the lab that karma helps in healing. So anyway, I think this is part of a bigger picture, and uh, it's, it's all about learning. I totally agree with that. Oh, that's fascinating to know that they're actually discovering through scientific experimentation that karma affects healing. That's incredible. Um, now, I would like to ask, though, I've heard that some of the ETs are not all that friendly and that actually um, they have very bad plans for us. Um, I know that there certainly are those that, uh, such as the Pleiadians, I've heard, are, are very much trying to help us in our evolution and they're standing back trying to allow us to evolve, which is why they don't reveal themselves to us, because they want us to, um, well, basically, they say that if they've revealed to us that that ETs are real, that UFOs are real, 
and what the game plan is, then we would never evolve. We kind of have to go through our own pain and suffering to be able to make our own achievements. But there are other aliens I've heard that um, are kind of using us um, in and have a um, – are trying to take us on a pathway to destruction. So um, I don't know if you if you're familiar with that. Have you crossed any any information about that? Well, yeah, you certainly find all kinds of information when you start delving into that whole business. And I think, I mean, to me, we're at this time where each of us needs to learn discernment. We need to learn how to develop our own intuition so we can sense what is true and what's untrue and learn how to filter. You know, we have amazing amounts of information uh, on the Internet. The, the problem is a lot of it's probably not true. Uh, anybody who wants to keep us in the dark, who wants to keep people, you know, keep these things covered up, all they have to do is put out false stories and get everybody running around chasing these false stories and that's just as good as keeping things secret in the first place. So, you know, the filtering of truth from fiction is really important for everyone to develop. Um, uh, what I, I, I would not discount, I wouldn't be surprised if there are, you know, two or three bad apples, two or three bad races that might not be very ethical. That wouldn't surprise me. Uh, and, you know, we're both kind of speculating. We Neither one of us probably have, you know, the absolute certain truth about any of this stuff. We have to kind of piece it together. The, the, the most important factor I see is that the law of karma appears to be a genuine law, and any advanced race probably knows that. And, therefore, that, that puts a break on what they can do because they're going to have to live with the consequences. Uh, I mean, for example, if the aliens had really had bad intentions toward Earth, they could have just wiped us out in 1947 or any time they wanted to. You know, we wouldn't have had a prayer. So yeah. the people, there's a lot of people who want to keep people in fear, who don't want this process to move forward. You know, they want to keep they want to keep Americans scared and dependent on the military and look at the world as a fearful world where the answer is violence, and that kind of keeps us trapped in our old patterns. Uh, and, yeah. and people who feel, feel that way are going to put out these scary stories and put out the scary rumors, and um, you have to watch out for that. So that, that is mixed in with, with all the true stuff. Um, so I tend to think most of them are fairly benevolent, or maybe they just don't care. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if some of them say, you know, these humans, they're pretty screwed up. I mean, look at how they're destroying their planet. they got runaway global warming, and they're not doing anything about it. they got runaway population, not doing anything about it. Uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't care about saving that race, and I can understand if a group of advanced beings felt that way. Um, but I believe that a group like that would probably not have the freedom to actually help it along because that would incur karma, negative karma for them. They'd have to, you know, suffer the consequences. So I think even the ones who think the least of us probably tend to hold back in terms of uh, interfering. And I, and I do believe there are some that are very benevolent and are trying to help us along. But like you say, they can't help too much because then their karma gets mixed up with us too. We have to grow up. We have to learn how to fix our own problems. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Swanson. I, um, I just have one more question. I know that Louis is waiting to talk to you. Um, so just one, one more question. I know that um, Robert Monroe was he he never believed in God the way that any of the world religions view God. And then Dr. Thomas Campbell certainly, I know you haven't read his trilogy yet, but he certainly uh, is not a God believer. And their view seems to be that it's more of a process of evolution and that we are creating 
our own reality and, and that there's nobody that created us who's controlling the world and who is going to send us to either heaven or hell. So my, my final question is, what have you been able to determine scientifically about God? Uh, you have nice, simple questions. I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that myself. <laughs> well, the first, I mean, the first, the first part of the question uh, would be to go to the idea of the spirit, let's say. Uh, we know from out-of-body experiences that consciousness can exist outside a body. We know from near-death experiences that when people's physical body dies, their consciousness continues. They go to one of these higher dimensions. They describe what they encounter there. Um, we we know from electronic voice phenomena that some of these spirits on the other side uh, still want to communicate back with us, and so there has been communication back and forth between these higher dimensions and our own. So we know that consciousness doesn't need a body to continue. Therefore, you can have spirits, uh, guides, angels, call them what you will. They are consciousnesses, in some cases, the very highly evolved, developed consciousnesses that can interact with us. And and to me, those are, are real. They exist in a higher dimension, but they still interact with the physical plane, so uh, I don't see a problem there. I think that this whole torsion model I've been talking about is a way of trying to understand how these spirits can exist in the higher dimensions to interact with us. So uh, Dr. Swanson, I am so sorry it's that time again, uh, but we're going to take a short break here. We will be right back on Truth Brigade Radio. You're listening to you. Truth Brigade Radio on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Um, this is the last segment with our special guest tonight, Dr. Claude Swanson. Again, you could uh, Google the name Claude, C-L-A-U-D-E, Swanson, or go, if you know how to spell, like I know all of the Truth Brigade listeners do, uh, synchronizeduniverse.com. Uh, hopefully, Olivia, if you're still there, we got uh, your questions answered tonight. Well, we, we didn't quite finish. <laughs> I, I, she gave me a really easy one at the end there was the, the nature of God, and, and I didn't quite finish that. <clears throat> so yeah, if easy you could, question. Give me a, of course. Give me a couple, a couple minutes to finish that if I could. Um, All right. So, so from what I can understand, I, I understand how uh, spirits, including intelligent spirits, including some that are very advanced, more uh, wiser than we are, uh, can exist. Uh, when we meditate or contact spirit guides or uh, angels, I think that they are, are of this form. Now, there's a whole hierarchy of these, and you can go to higher dimensions and larger and larger volumes of our universe, and you can have uh, spirits or consciousness uh, associated with uh, you know any one of these different levels. Uh, many wise people say that each planet has its own consciousness. Um, and for example, in my synchronized universe model that I describe in the last chapter of my book, uh, the whole universe is linked together with synchronized vibrations. That's what ena enables us to see each other. That's what enables matter to experience forces. That's part of what's in our physics, although it happens at a deeper level, so our physics doesn't really know about it. What that means is the universe is linked together. So you can think about the universe as being a consciousness, the largest all-encompassing consciousness that we can imagine. It has a record of all the events that have happened. It determines all the things that could happen. Uh, and I think there's an intelligence that's there that we can think of as God or the ultimate God um, and then we could take subsets of that, like a planet or a solar system is having intelligence, and sort of look at the spirits that uh, are present there. So in, in my view, consciousness pervades the universe, and um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's a very exciting place as we get into quieting our mind, we can make contact with that consciousness. Wow. Olivia, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much, Dr. Swanson. <laughs> is that, All is that right. Really? I didn't mean to... I, I didn't really mean to, like, uh, uh, give you some really tough ones there, but I sure do appreciate... Uh, all the time that you've been spending answering my questions. Thank you very, very well, much. Well, you a you asked really good questions, and if you read my book in the in the in the introduction or the preface, I, I say that this 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 has been one of the big problems for me. Uh, that when I look at our world, we have uh, uh, some people who are conservative uh, Christians or conservative religious uh, points of view, and then some who are scientific who are anti-religious or atheist, and to me, if we have the real, complete understanding of things, there's not going to be that contradiction. There's not going to be a split. The two are both partly right and partly wrong, and the ultimate unified field theory will include both. All right. Thank wow. You. Thank you Olivia. very much, Dr. Spahn. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for calling in, and any time. I really appreciated your easy questions, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. What can much. I say? I guess I, helped, I, I guess I helped make it interesting, Christy. Absolutely, <laughs> always, and bless you for that. Thank you. We have um, about two minutes left, unfortunately. Louie, I'm so sorry, but you know I, I know. Ah! So okay, we we got you here. I I hear you loud and clear. Oh, you have it easy. easy. Oh Wait, crap! I, just, I, I thought I was still muted. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh damn. Um, okay. Uh, quick question, doctor. How were you able to fix the problem uh, that was suggested by Michio Kaku uh, on teleportation? The original person dies. And, and a copy uh, ha uh, shows up on the other side. When a person dies and a copy shows well, up? Um, well, because um, Michio, Michio Kaku um, suggested that uh, interpretation, you break, it breaks down matter, and essentially the person dies. The original person dies, and a copy appears on the other the teleportation. I just wanted to know if that problem was yeah. fixed. Well, one 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 difficulty I have with Michio Kaku and and some of the other uh, uh, string theorists who basically do conventional physics, although they kind of dabble in the paranormal, uh, is that they really uh, what they have looked at is from the viewpoint of high energy physics, which has developed its own theories for matter but has not looked at any of the paranormal studies like teleportation, levitation, ESP, <clears throat> things like that. They're not really trying to explain those things, and in fact, they don't fit very easily into their theories uh, because most of their theories are leaving out some of this new information. Um, so I don't, look, I don't view teleportation as a person dying. I mean, I think that's a very different process. Uh, when a person dies, the pattern of the physical body uh, dissolves. Uh, you know, it goes away, uh, and what's left are the higher dimensional aspects of that person's consciousness. Excellent information, Dr. Swanson. I am so sorry. And, Louis, I'm so sorry we're out of time. I, I hope this helps. And, Dr. Swanson, thank you so much for being here tonight. Guest, the web. You're very welcome. My, my pleasure. Thank you. All right. I, I hope to see you all tomorrow night. Truth Brigade Radio.